My extensive teaching practice has shown me that club players rarely manage to get standard book openings in their games, which means of course that the vast majority of opening material is simply irrelevant to their needs. I've come to the conclusion that an alternative approach is advisable, one based on being practical and cunning. The lines I'm going to show you in this video might be dismissed by the purist as being dirty tricks. Personally, I think that such objections are just nonsense. The question you have to ask yourself is whether or not you want to win more games. The lines I'll be showing you loosely form the basis of a repertoire. Alternatively, you can pick and choose from amongst these ideas for those that most appeal to you. The move that I normally recommend to my students is 1E4, because it's this move, above all others, that leads most of the sharp tactical clashes that develop our combinative skills. After Black's reply E5, I suggest going one step further by playing an old-fashioned gambit opening, like the Danish with D4, or the King's Gambit with F4. Now those amongst you who don't respect such openings should note that Gary Kasparov himself has played the Evans Gambit. Most black players, when faced with these openings, will be very nervous indeed, and probably react very passively. After f4, I would expect that a lot of your opponents will play something like 2d6, just trying to defend their pawn on e5. Unfortunately for black, this is rather a bad line, because all his pieces now, especially the bishop on f8, are badly restricted. Play could proceed with, say, knight c3, and after knight f6, white could play knight f3, and then if black defends his pawn on e5, with knight out to c6, white can pin this knight on c6 with bishop b5, once again renewing the, the threat to the pawn on e5. If black defends, say, with bishop d7, then white can play d3, once again threatening this pawn on e5. Sooner or later, black will probably give up the centre with e takes f4. And after bishop takes f4, white's pieces will reach an ideal deployment. Over the next few moves, white will castle, then be able to mobilise his central pawns, say with d4, and bring his queen's rook into play, say with queen d2 and rook a e1. It's very difficult to get such good positions after so few moves with something more respectable like the Rai Lopez, which just shows the benefits of adopting a cunning and psychological approach to opening problems. Aggressive play at club level really pays off. In the unlikely event, that your opponent does actually know something about the King's Gambit, then I'll show you something that might give them quite a surprise, a move invented by the Spanish GM Miguel Ilescas. After e takes f4, knight f3, the most challenging move is supposed to be g5. Now after h4, g4, the respectable choice for white is supposed to be knight e5, the so-called Kieseritsky gambit. If black gets this far, he probably knows what he's doing. So instead of knight e5, I recommend that you play knight g5, the old-fashioned Algaia gambit. Now after h6, you have to sacrifice a piece with knight takes f7, because the knight has got no retreat squares. 
But after king takes f7, black's best developed piece is his king, and it's not going to have a safe place to go. The old move in this position was bishop c4 check, but then after d5, bishop takes d5 check, king g7, black's next move of knight f6 would attack this important white bishop on d5. Instead of bishop c4 check, the move that super GM Ileskus came up with was a quiet developing move, knight out to c3, with which he used to carve up people in Spanish open tournaments. There's no theory on this move, but looking at it at home, I concluded that white has got good compensation for his piece. Black's king on f7 will be permanently exposed. Probably he won't be able to hold this pawn on f4, and when that pawn goes, the f-file will be opened. In addition to this, white has got strong central pawns after d4. In theory, people may um and ah about sacrifices like this, but in practice, you'll score devastating results. The thought of facing horrors such as the King's Gambit or the Danish after e5 makes many black players want to take refuge behind a wall of pawns, and for this reason they often play things like the French Defence or the Karakan, with c6 followed on the next move by d5. Most of your opponents will only have a basic knowledge of Karakan theory and will be pre-programmed to play certain moves no matter what white does. You can turn this to your advantage by adopting a tricky move order with knight out to c3 and then after d5 you bring your knight out to f3. The first point of this idea is that if black plays d takes e4 knight takes e4 and now the typical Karakan move bishop f5 White can play his knight to g3. If black still doesn't notice any difference, he may play his bishop back to g6, whereupon you play h4, and he plays h6. All these moves are well known to theory had white got his pawn on d4, rather than having his knight on f3. But now there's a very great difference. In this position, White can achieve a big advantage by playing knight into e5. After bishop h7, he can play queen out to h5, threatening mate on f7. After black fends white off with g6, white can bring his bishop out to c4. If black now takes the queen with g takes h5, then bishop takes f7 is mate. Black therefore has to play e6, after which white's queen would finally be forced to retreat, say to f3 or e2. The resulting position would be terrible for black. Not only is his kingside pawn structure severely weakened, but this bishop on h7 really has got no prospects whatsoever. White's position is close to winning. After de, Knight takes e4. Instead of bishop f5, another popular setup for black is to play knight to d7, intending knight g f6. Against this, you can try a really cunning move, playing the queen to e2. Now, if black continues mechanically with knight g to f6, then all of a sudden there occurs knight d6, mate because the pawn on e7 is pinned against the king. If black realises in time what you're up to, then he'll probably play his knight on d7 to f6. But then you can use this move queen e2 as one step towards queenside castling by now playing b3. After knight takes e4, queen takes e4, knight f6, I recommend that you play your queen to f4 and follow up 
with the moves bishop b2, queenside castling, bishop d3, and rook d e1. In this position, we see that white has taken advantage of the fact that his pawn is not on d4 to give his bishops very strong diagonals from b2 up to g7 and d3 up to h7. Later on, white might be able to play knight e5 and then trundle his g-pawn up the board. After d takes e4, knight takes e4, a line that you might come across quite a lot is knight out to f6, and after knight takes f6 check, black might take with a g-pawn, g takes f6. Black's idea in this line is to be able to get counterplay on the g-file, and probably castle on the queen side. White's most effective plan is to immediately block the g-file by going g3 and bishop g2, and in fact this bishop on g2 will form the basis of a future attack by white against black's queenside castled king. In the subsequent play, white will put his king over on the king side, and then probably start throwing his queenside pawns forward to cooperate with his bishop on g2, say with d3, bishop e3, b4 and a4. The eventual b5 push will start to undermine black's queenside pawn structure. At club level, I think that d takes e4 is the move that's most likely to occur in practice. But now let's have a look at some of the other moves. If black plays d4, attacking the knight on c3, then white replies knight to e2, and after c5, he challenges this pawn on d4 with c3. Now if black takes on c3, then white will recapture with his b-pawn, and then set up a broad pawn center with d4. It would be a serious mistake for black to push this pawn on with d3, as after knight f4, the pawn on d3 would have to be supported by c4, whereupon white, with queen a4 check, would pick up not only this pawn on c4, but then the guy on d3 would fall as well. If your opponent happens to be booked up and plays the theoretical move, bishop out to g4, I think you should play h3, which is normal. But if he now plays bishop takes f3, then instead of taking with the queen on f3, which is the normal move, I think you should play an old move, which was once played by Mikhail Tal in his match for the World Championship in 1960 with Mikhail Botvinnik. Tal, amazingly, played g takes f3. After e6, Tal went d4, and after Botvinnik's knight d7, he made the mistake of bringing his bishop out to the f4 square. It would have been much better had he played his bishop out to e3, and followed up with queen d2, followed by castle in queenside. In this position, White has got a strong centre, the two bishops, and an open g-file. Instead of bishop takes f3, Black's other move is to drop the bishop back to h5. White can then play e takes d5, and after c takes d5, go bishop b5 check. In this position, Black's bishop on h5 would really like to be able to go over to d7, but unfortunately it's shut out of play on the king's side. He's therefore forced to play knight c6, after which g4, bishop g6, knight e5, steps up the pressure on this knight on c6. Black should play rook c8, and after d4, he should go e6. But then h4 is likely to upset a lot of the players of the black pieces. White's threat is to play the move h5, trapping this bishop on g6. If black defends against this with f6, then white eliminates this important bishop with knight takes g6. 
and after h g he can play bishop back to d three hitting the pawn on g six black would then have an awkward decision to make between going king f seven and blocking his bishop on f eight in with a move knight g e seven last but not least let's look at the move knight f six on black's third move after which e five knight e four has been played the book move is knight e two hoping to eject this knight on e four with d three what i recommend is a move used by that great master of the attack rudolf spielman in a game against a guy called walter in trenchin to plitz nineteen twenty seven spielman played queen e two attacking this knight in e four black took on c three and spielman accelerated his development by going d takes c three opening up this bishop on c one black played b six and now spielman brought his knight into d four black attacked the knight with c five and now spielman played a beautiful trick with e six the point of this is that if black now takes this knight on d4 with cd then white can play queen b5 check and after knight d7 he goes e takes f7 check king takes f7 is forced and now queen takes d5 check forks the king on f7 and the rook on a8 in many ways the french defense which goes for e6 followed by d5 is rather similar to the caracan once again players of the black pieces will tend to want to close the game up and neutralize any possible white attacking chances the french is one of the most difficult openings for club players to get to grips with because of its slow strategic nature but i'm going to show you a line with which you can inhibit Black's counterplay and take pot shots at his king. I first saw it used by a player that used to play for the same team as me in Germany, a guy called Peter Rals. On the second move, he used to play knight out to f3, and then after d5, he went e5. Black, no doubt thinking it was a normal advanced French, went c5, and then he would shock them rigid with the amazing move b4 not many french defense players can refuse the offer of a pawn so they all go c takes b4 ross would continue anyway with d4 and now the point of his idea was revealed one of the main ideas behind the french defense is that black launches a counterattack against this d4 pawn in this particular position the pawn which would do that is now sitting on b4. The overall result is that white can start a kingside attack without any disturbances. His next moves will be something like bishop d3, and then h4, and knight out to g5. Black may try to escape the danger by putting his king on the queen side. But white will find it very easy to open up lines there too by going a3. And after b takes a3, there's an open a and b file. So much for the theory. Let's see how this gambit works out in practice. First of all, I'll show you a game between two Russian guys, Mr. Shasin against Mr. Naglis. Black played knight c6 in this position. White decided to play a3 immediately. Black took this pawn with b a, and now White supported this d4 pawn very securely by going c3. Black decided to try and block off the king side, and he went f5. But now White set in motion a plan to undermine this pawn on f5 with bishop d3, bishop d7, 
and now H3 intending G4. Black took precautions against this with G6, but then G4 followed anyway. And after knight H6, white took time out to take off this pawn on A3, with knight takes A3. Black stopped this knight from jumping into B5, with a move A6. After which, white played his bishop out to the G5 square. Unable to play bishop E7, because the knight on h6 hangs, black was forced to move his queen to the c8 square, whereupon white brought his bishop right into black's guts with bishop f6, hitting the rook on h8. Black played his rook to g8, and then queen d2 left black in a really terrible mess, because none of his pieces can move, and his king stuck in the centre. It'll be no surprise to you to learn that White won this game in a mere 28 moves. In the next example, we see the man himself, Peter Rouse, playing this line against a guy called Chirochkin. After knight c6, a3, bishop d7, White played ab, bishop takes b4 check, and now c3, once again securing this d4 pawn. The bishop came back to e7, and after bishop d3, black really had a problem about how to develop this knight on g8, because if he brings it out to h6, then white is going to play bishop takes h6, inflicting serious pawn weaknesses on black's position. Unable to bring the g8 knight out, Black played a6, and now Ralphs played his patented kingside attacking move, h4. Black proceeded with his queenside action, with b5, but then knight g5 set in motion a typical Ralphs attack. On this occasion he didn't manage to win, but that says nothing about the position at the moment. White has got very good attacking chances. In the last example of the system against the French, White actually delayed the move d4 and instead played a3. After knight c6, a takes b4, bishop takes b4, White played c3, bishop e7, and now d4 to get the same kind of setup. Again, black had this problem of not being able to bring his knight out to h6 because of white's bishop on c1 taking off the knight and ruining black's pawns. So instead, he played bishop d7, and after bishop d3, went knight a5 this time. Once again, white sounded the charge with h4, and after black stopped knight g5, by going h6, white brought his rook into play with rook h3, and on the next move played rook g3, putting serious pressure on black's king side. It really isn't clear where black's king should go in this line. If he goes onto the queen side, there's the open a and b files, and if he goes to the king side, white has got very strong attacking chances because of his extra space and active pieces. The most popular of all black's defences to e4 is, of course, the Sicilian defence, with 1c5. But interestingly enough, you can play a similar gambit to the one we've just seen against the French defence. The great American player, Frank Marshall, once said that the wing gambit, with b4, leads to some beautiful combinations and positions and that, like all gambits, the idea is to secure a strong centre, quick development, and a chance for combinations. Unfortunately, the immediate wing gambit, with 2b4, and after c takes b4, a3, is not especially good, because black can counter-attack in the centre with d5. I once won a game in five moves with black in this position. White played e takes d5, and after queen takes d5, 
a takes b4, which is a serious blunder. I went queen e5 check, forking the king on e1 and the rook on a1, after which my opponent resigned. In fact, it's much better to delay this move, b4, by first playing your knight out to f3, and asking black what move he's going to play next. If he plays e6, then b4, c takes b4, d4, can transpose into the line we looked at against the French, if black now plays the natural d5, and you go e5. The Estonian genius Paul Keres also had a fondness for the wing gambit, and he played it in a couple of games, one against a6, he went b4, because a6 is rather a useless move. And against d6, he also went b4. Finally, we come to the move knight c6, after which b4 appears to make less sense, because black can capture it with the knight. However, white can then use the time he gets by going c3, to build up a strong pawn centre. Black would have to retreat the knight, say to c6, and then d4 would happen. After c takes d4, cd, one example of play that springs to mind is d5, e takes d5, queen takes d5, and now white gains time on this queen on d5 with knight c3. If black plays queen a5, white can respond, say, with bishop d2. And then if black stops this move d5 by going e6, white could play bishop b5, pinning this knight on c6. If black breaks the pin with bishop d7, white can play d5. And after e takes d5, play the surprising move Knight takes d5, hitting black's queen on a5 with this bishop on d2, and meeting queen takes b5 with knight c7 check. If black were to retreat his queen to d8, then white could castle, with a tremendous lead in development and rook e1 check coming. Black's position looks barely defensible in this particular variation. After b4, in his book Beating the Anti-Sicilians, Gallagher gives one of his own games, Stanton Gallagher, played in London in the early 1980s, which went c takes b4, d4, and now e6, d5, queen f6. This is getting really wild, with white's rook on a1 and black's knight on c6 both hanging. White played c3, and after b c, he took the knight on c6, with d takes c6. Black then won the rook on a1, with c2, queen takes c2, queen takes a1. The game proceeded with moves queen b3, a5, c takes b7, bishop takes b7, Bishop out to d3, Bishop b4 check, White played his king to e2, Black brought his queen back to f6, White hit this bishop on b4 with a move a3, and then Black, unable to move this bishop because the bishop on b7 would hang, brought his queen back to e7 claiming that this was a mess. Taken together with Gallagher's comment that anyway these lines are pretty academic, if you get one every ten years it will probably be above average, you can take it as proof positive that even a Sicilian expert like Joe Gallagher, a Grand Master, is quite unprepared for the deferred wing gambit. Just imagine how surprised your opponents will be.
Against the Piet's defence, with 1d6, I suggest you try a line that hasn't been seen for years, but one which was used by Nigel Short when he first burst onto the scene. Nigel used to play d4, knight f6, knight c3, and after g6, he immediately posted his king's bishop on the most aggressive diagonal with bishop out to c4. Black would play bishop g7, and then Nigel brought his queen to e2 with the idea of going e5. The most natural reaction by Black to this queen e2 move is to counterattack the pawn on d4 by going knight out to c6. But then, the point of the whole idea is revealed. White goes e5, attacking the knight on f6. If black proceeds with his plan by playing knight takes d4, then white doesn't move his queen, but instead lops off this knight on f6, with e takes f6. And after knight takes e2, f takes g7, Rook g8, knight g takes e2, gets three pieces for his queen and two pawns. At first sight, this may not seem like a very good transaction, but black's king is still dangerously poised in the centre of the board. A typical example of play is from a game Thomas Edwards, England 1980, which proceeded with the moves rook takes g7, Bishop h6, the rook came back to g8, and now white castled long, completing the development of his forces. Black played e6, whereupon white thrust his h-pawn forward with h4. Black went queen e7, getting ready to castle queenside in a few minutes, and then white played his knight to e4 threatening to bring his bishop back to g5, with a terrible accident happening on the f6 square. Black was forced to play f6, whereupon white replied with knight on 2 to c3. At this moment, black should really have gone bishop d7, but instead he made the terrible mistake of thinking he could win a piece with d5. There followed bishop takes d5, ED, knight takes d5, and now this knight on e4 couldn't be taken because of knight takes f6 check. Instead black played queen e5, but after knight e takes f6 check, king f7, rook h e1, his king was helpless in the centre of the board. Sometimes you might meet an opponent who tries to get his dirty tricks in first, and such a player may play d5 on the first move, and after e takes d5, go knight f6. Recently, the line c4, e6, offering a pawn for fast development, or d4, bishop g4, has become very popular at club level, and these lines are very difficult and dangerous for white to handle. But after knight f6, I recommend the cunning move bishop e2, which prevents bishop g4, of course. If black now plays knight takes d5, then you stop him coming into f4 by playing d4. White's plan in this position is to play his knight out to f3, castle kingside, drive this knight from the d5 square by going c4, whereupon it would probably have to go back to b6, and then play knight c3, bishop f4, queen d2, and bring his rooks to e1 and d1. With such a setup, white would be guaranteed a space advantage, 
for the rest of the game, and Black would find it very difficult to get the counterplay that he craves. If Black recaptures with the Queen on d5, then White will proceed with a similar type of setup. He'll still go Knight f3, followed by castles, and d4, and later drive the Queen from this d5 square by going c4, Knight c3, and the same Bishop f4, Queen d2 setup. This setup with white pawns on d4 and c4, gives white very strong central control in the middle game. You can also use it if, after e takes d5, black immediately plays queen takes d5. White should then play knight out to f3, followed by bishop e2, and d4, castles, and c4, as in the previous examples. For this reason, I think it's actually a mistake for White to play knight out to c3 in this position, blocking his pawn on c2. After queen a5, White will find it very difficult to establish a serious control of the centre in the middle game. There are signs that the world's top players are now switching to this knight f3, bishop e2, d4, c4 plan with both Nigel Short and Nick DeFermian having adopted it in recent games. In addition to its objective strength, just think how annoying it will be for your opponents to face a line that's not covered in the books. Let's move on now to the black pieces. If your opponent opens with 1e4 against you, I again recommend that you play for an open game with 1e5. The line that's supposed to be the strongest for white now is the Spanish opening or Rai Lopez which goes knight f3, knight c6 and now bishop b5. In one of my previous videos I recommended that black meet this with a6, bishop a4, knight f6, castles, and now bishop c5, the so-called molar defence. This is a really interesting line for black. In fact, so interesting, after bishop b5, a6, many white players will try and avoid such possibilities by black and just take this knight off on c6, the boring exchange variation. Now after d takes c6, the most usual move is for white to castle, and then black can try and spruce things up a bit with bishop g4 and if h3, h5. If white now makes the mistake of taking this bishop on g4 with hg, hg, then he opens up the h file for black, which puts him in severe danger of being mated. If white moves his knight, say to h2, there follows queen h4, and knight takes g4, it's met by queen h1 mate. Going back to the moment where white played bishop takes c6, if he plays bishop a4, and now black plays the Steinitz deferred line with d6, one interesting line is when white castles, and now black pins this knight on f3 with bishop g4. Once again, White almost always hits the bishop on g4 with h3, and again black can defend this bishop with h5. This h5 idea will certainly come as a shock to your opponents, and the game can end very, very quickly if they foolishly play hg, hg, knight h2, queen h4, knight takes g4, queen h1 mate. If you like attacking down the h-file with this h5 move, another defence that might appeal to you is the bird's defence with knight d4. In his book Chess History and Reminiscences, Bird, with a little hint of pride, noted that this defence is condemned by all authorities. 
In fact, it's a very dangerous line for white to meet. After knight takes d4, ed, black's pawn on d4 is like a thorn in white's side, and his bishop on b5 is rather out of play. If white immediately tries to undermine this d4 pawn with c3, then queen g5 simultaneously hits the bishop on b5 and the pawn on g2, and forces the humiliating reply, bishop f1. Even a world champion, Alexander Alekin, once had trouble with this bishop on b5, and now I'm going to show you a particularly dirty trick. In his game against Joseph Henry Blackburn, from the 1914 St. Petersburg tournament, Alekin castled, whereupon Black now fianchettoed this bishop on f8 with g6, which is slightly unusual. I think it should really come to c5. The game went on with d3, getting ready to develop this bishop on c1, bishop g7. Now Alekin started trying to attack with f4. Black hit the b5 bishop with a move c6. The bishop came back to c4. And now Blackburn hit it again with d5. After e takes d5, c takes d5, Alekin couldn't resist the check on b5, whereupon Blackburn played the super sneaky king f8. Oblivious to his opponent's plans, Alekin now played knight d2, and was suddenly hit by the move queen a5, attacking the bishop on b5, which has got no decent squares. White's only move in this position is to protect the bishop with a4, but then a6 traps it once and for all. Amazingly, Alekin managed to escape with a draw, but let's face it, it was rather miraculous. Blackburn learnt this defence from the maestro himself, Harold Bird, in a game they played in Belfast in 1892. Blackburn played d3, whereupon Bird immediately played this move h5, which at the moment seems to have neither rhyme nor reason. Logically enough, Blackburn set about undermining this d4 pawn with c3, whereupon Bird brought his bishop out to its best square with bishop c5. Blackburn castled. Bird hit this bishop on b5 with the move c6, and after the bishop dropped back to a4, Bird played d6, getting ready to bring out this bishop on c8. Blackburn now brought his queen to the e1 square, possibly envisaging something like e5, which Bird immediately prevented by bringing his queen out to f6, and also preparing some attacking ideas against White's king on g1. White now shuffled his king into the corner with king h1, whereupon Bird brought out his knight with knight h6. Only at this moment did it dawn on Blackburn that if he now plays his programmed f4 move, then Bird's knight will land on g4 and he'll be unable to shift it. If White ever plays h3, then Black can calmly ignore this, because once again, h takes g4, h takes g4, would open up this h file with deadly effect. On seeing possibilities such as this, Blackburn played the passive move f3. And after h4, Bird went on to win a beautiful game, which in fact won in the best game prize. One of the problems with playing e5 on the first move is that it allows white a large range of surprising options, from the king's gambit, to the Danish, to bishop's opening, to the Vienna. Rather than face such unpleasant surprises, I suggest that you think about playing not e5 on the first move, but first of all, knight c6. Most whites who want to play the Spanish, or Ryla Pez, 
will now play knight f3, whereupon e5, bishop b5, gets you into what you want. If white still tries to get a Vienna in with knight c3, then black needn't cooperate with e5, but instead he can play the move e6, then bring his bishop out to b4, and play, say, d6 and knight g7. People who play the bishop's opening might go two bishop c4 in this position, but black can neutralise this by going e6, followed by d5, winning time against the bishop. Another move that would be a mistake for white in this position is to treat it as a king's gambit with f4, because black could once again hit back in the centre with d5, and after e takes d5, queen takes d5, we get a kind of Scandinavian defence, but where this pawn on f4 is merely a weakness, and black has gained the extra developing move knight c6. Black would follow up with something like bishop f5 and castles queenside, and have a really excellent game. I'm not sure how often you'll be called upon to face the book move, d4, but against this you should hit back with d5. If white now takes this pawn on d5, with ed, it brings black's queen out into the fray with queen takes d5, hitting the pawn on d4. White will probably defend it with knight f3, and then you can play an old gambit suggested by Aaron Nimzovich with e5. Most white players, on being surprised like this, would probably try and shuffle away into a pawn up endgame, thinking to themselves that this couldn't possibly be bad. Unfortunately for them, they'd be quite wrong, because after d takes e5, queen takes d1 check, king takes d1, black prepares queenside castling with bishop out to g4, incidentally hitting this pawn on e5 once again. If white defends this pawn with bishop f4, then black will castle long, check. White will fend off the check with knight bd2, and then bishop c5 hits this pawn on f2. White is in all kinds of trouble in this position. If he defends this f2 pawn with bishop g3, then black can proceed with knight h6, followed by knight f5, and rook h e8, where not only will he recover the e5 pawn, but he'll have a strong attack to boot. If white defends the f2 pawn with king e1, he gets into even bigger trouble because now black strikes out on the other side of the board with knight b4, hitting this c2 pawn. White can't defend this with bishop d3, because then rook takes d3, cd, knight takes d3 check, forks the king on e1, and the bishop on f4. Black wins material and would go on to win the endgame. Rather than open the game up with e takes d5, I suspect that most of your opponents would try and keep it closed with e5. Against this, I suggest you play the provocative move f6, immediately attacking this e5 pawn. After seeing this move, a lot of white players will be unable to resist the temptation of playing bishop d3, which intends to go queen h5 check. But I think that black can actually ignore this by taking off this pawn on d4, knight takes d4. If white then goes queen h5 check, you can calm the answer with g6, and if he now follows up with bishop takes g6 check, you give him your rook on h8, with hg, queen takes h8. White's fun has come to an end, 
and black can now retaliate with knight takes c2 check, king d1. Rather than immediately taking this rook, I suggest that black opts for fast development with bishop f5, intending queen d7 followed by castling long. I think the important factor in this position is time, and white's king is in great danger of being caught in the centre and mated. Black also has the option of taking this a1 rook at leisure. The books just give knight takes d4 a question mark, saying that queen h5 check is good for white. But my gut feeling is that the opposite may well be true. The books give knight c3 as white's best move, but I'm really not sure how often you'll be called on to face this. I'm going to show you a really dirty trick, in which an unsuspecting white can very easily fall. I recommend that you play e6, and if white now plays the natural move knight f3, you reply with knight f6. White's most obvious move in this position is to go e5, after which black jumps into the centre with knight e4. White can try and attack this knight on e4 with bishop d3, whereupon black will pin the knight on c3 with bishop out to b4. To protect c3, white would have to play bishop d2. Black can take the bishop on d2 with his knight, and white would have to retake with the queen. This position may seem innocent enough, and you might expect black to play something like f6, trying to undermine this pawn on e5. Few whites would be prepared for the move knight takes d4, which looks absolutely unbelievable. It just seems to give up a piece for nothing. But after knight takes d4, black attacks this knight on d4 with a move c5, and now something like knight back to f3 is met by d4, winning back a piece. The critical move is knight d to b5, hoping to get in knight d6 check. Rather than play d4, however, Black now simply castles kingside, maintaining the threat of d4, and in addition, threatening to attack this other knight on b5 with a6. The great German grandmaster Siegbert Tarasch once stumbled into this position against Alapin at Café de Monaco, 1902. He tried to riddle out of his mess with a3, and after bishop a5, forcibly broke the pin on his knight on c3 by going b4. The game continued with the moves c takes b4, and now Tarash dropped this knight on c3 back to e2. Alapin took yet another pawn for his sacrifice piece with b takes a3, and Tarash was forced to play c3. Alapin now hit the knight on b5 with the move a6. The knight came back to d4, and now black blew away the last vestiges of white's pawn centre with f6. Tarash took the pawn on f6, and Alapin recaptured with his queen, threatening queen takes f2 check. Tarash got out of this by simply castling, but then the move e5 started black's centre pawns trundling forward. Tarash dropped his knight on d4 back to b3, and now Alapin played his bishop back to b6, renewing this threat against the f2 pawn. Black's bishop pair on b6 and c8 are immensely strong in this open position, and his pawns on d5 and e5 severely restrict white's pieces. Black has got excellent compensation for a piece, and went on to win in fine style. Going back to move 5, 
If white defends this e4 pawn with bishop d3, we get a direct transposition into the previous line with bishop b4, e5, knight e4. And now bishop d2 is met by knight takes d2, queen takes d2, knight takes d4. To understand how unpleasant this move would be for your opponents, just imagine how you'd feel if someone did it to you. If white plays d4 on his first move, it's unlikely at club level that he's going to follow this up with c4. What you're far more likely to meet is either a collie with e3 and bishop d3, or a stonewall attack with f4, or a Trompovsky with bishop g5. The world is just full of such players. In order to get a nice open game with black, the defence I often recommend is the Chigorin, in which black plays d5, and now if white goes c4, you play knight c6, immediately counter-attacking against the d4 pawn. This move d5 also has some definite advantages should your opponent now want to play the Trompovsky with bishop g5 or some collie attack with e3. What White really dreams about with this e3 move is to build up an automatic kingside attack. And if black cooperates too much, he can be in terrible danger. If, for example, he plays knight out to f6 and white goes bishop d3, and then black plays e6, white may consider a stonewall attack with f4. If black continues just natural development with bishop e7, then white can play knight out to f3. Black castles, white castles, and let's suppose that now black develops his bishop on c8 with b6 which all the books tell us is a wise thing to do. White might now play knight e5, and after bishop b7, he could go rook f3. If you play c5 with black, he might go rook h3, and now knight c6 is absolutely disastrous because of bishop takes h7 check. Knight takes h7, would once again fall victim to this h-file attack. White would play queen h5, hitting the knight, and if it moved, say to f6, then queen h8 is mate. When you see your opponent putting the bishop on this menacing d3 square, I think it's a good idea to neutralise it as quickly as possible. One way of doing this is to go g6, followed by bishop g7 which effectively defends your h7 square. Another way is to play bishop out to g4, and after f3, for example, the bishop can drop back to h5 and then g6, once again neutralising the bishop on d3. When white plays his bishop to d3, it's really only with one plan in mind, and if black stops this, then white will really have nothing else to do. The Trompovsky attack with two bishop g5 is now so popular that you're almost sure to meet it. Against d5, however, it's much less effective, because now white's bishop on g5 doesn't hit black's knight, which would normally have gone to f6. Against bishop g5, I suggest that you play h6, and after the bishop drops back to h4, you go c6. This may seem rather modest, but if white's not very, very careful now, he can lose a piece. If white plays e3, and black goes queen b6, hitting this b2 pawn, white will probably play b3 or queen c1. In either case, black now hits out in the centre with e5, and if white foolishly takes this pawn, with d, e, 
Black goes queen b4 check, hitting white's king on e1 and the bishop on h4. This dirty trick was invented by British Grandmaster John Spielman and has since been adopted by other great players like Vladimir Kramnik of Russia. In addition to d5, you might also want to consider the provocative knight c6. If white now continues automatically with c4, then black can hit back in the center with e5. If white pushes on with d5, bring your bishop on f8 out with bishop b4 check. White would probably block this with bishop d2, whereupon you can exchange bishops, bishop takes d2 check, and after queen takes d2, drop your knight on c6 back to e7. Black can now mobilize his pieces for future kingside action with d6 followed by knight f6 and knight g6. If white castles kingside, black's knights may be very useful in a later kingside assault. This knight c6 move will be particularly irritating for collie players because now if they play their collie e3, Black takes the initiative with e5. If white tries to get in a Tromposky still with bishop out to g5, then I recommend you do the following. First of all, you can hit this bishop with a move f6. Let's say the bishop retreats to h4. I think that then black should start taking the lion's share of the center with d5. After white continues developing with e3, I like the move knight h6, intending knight f5. After the bishop drops back to g3, then knight f5 can come anyway, and then c4 is met by e5. A line I looked at at home runs d takes e5, d4, e takes f6, bishop out to b4 check, white blocks the check with knight d2, and then black can castle, meeting f takes g7 with rook e8. Black has got a tremendous attack in this position, e4 being met by rook takes e4 check, and when white blocks the check on e2, say with knight e2, there's d3 winning a piece. Although this line may seem fantastic, it does reveal some of black's attacking possibilities. A lot of whites are going to become very suspicious after you play your knight out to c6, and may try and bolster up this d4 pawn by bringing the knight out to f3. All they'll achieve by this, however, is to lose some of their options against the Chigorin defense should you now play d5. Some white players might actually be offended by this knight c6 move. I want to punish you with d5, knight e5, and after e4, e6, hit the knight again with f4. This, however, can get them into all sorts of trouble. Black can calmly bring his bishop on f8 out to c5, and if white now takes this knight on e5, with f takes e5, Queen h4 check follows. g3 is now met by queen takes e4 check, winning the rook on h1. White would therefore have to play king d2, a move I'm sure that he'd be very reluctant to do. After queen takes e4, his king will be permanently stuck in the center and attacked by black's massed pieces. The immediate threat is to go queen e3 mate. You can get similar lines to these against the flank openings. If white, for example, plays knight f3, you bring your knight out to c6, and then e4 is met by e5, or d4 is met by d5. Both these lines give you a chance to get into things we've already looked at. 
against the English opening with c4, you can also play knight c6, provoking white into playing d4, whereupon you can go either e5 or d5. If white sticks to the usual English paths, say with knight c3, you might be able to get in one final dirty trick. After e5, knight f3, knight f6, most English players try and fianchetto their king's bishop with g3. Black usually plays either bishop b4 or d5 in this position. But what about going knight d4? A lot of whites might be sorely tempted to take this pawn on e5 with knight takes e5. But after queen e7, dropping the knight back to d3 allows knight f3 mate. Armed with these lines, don't expect to win any friends. What you will win is your games in brutal and dramatic fashion.